Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the Dow Jones Industrial with the MACD on it. And you can see that we've got the three major tops here in the MACD. We've got the dot-com top, the financial crisis, and now the current one. So let's clear this off and pull up the Williams R. That's another indicator. I tend to watch Williams percentage R. And you can see on this indicator that we have for the first time here now, we have a new low that is only rivaled by really two other times here. And that's going to be the a dot com bubble just like we showed before uh, and the financial crisis so we've gone below where we were in 2011 that was kind of a bounce where we didn't really have a serious decline we bounced and got a low there we're now below that it's starting to look like um, we're going to get follow through down to here something like that now, if we get that type of follow through like we've had in the past, that's going to be devastating for things like pension funds and uh, other things because, of course, we're in a zero interest rate environment. So investment uh, groups, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, um, they've all been dependent on these overly um, generous stock market gains that we've really had uh, continuously since about March of 2009. If this goes into reverse, and I think it is going to this time, then we're going to see rolling crises through uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, countries. We're now seeing Puerto Rico on the verge, and we're just going to see more and more as uh, the financial markets go down. So I wanted to go over to this article from Jeff Berwick. Uh, Jeff is now starting to cover the silver story, and that's good. It's good to see more people cover uh, the story about the increasing premiums and the how hard it is to find certain kinds of silver. So let's read this. At some point in the next few years, it will become harder and possible to buy silver or gold in exchange for fiat currencies. We aren't at the impossible stage yet, but there are signs around the world that silver is becoming difficult to buy, and if you can find some of the premiums over spot, paper price are extraordinary and rising. Following my own advice here at the Dollar Vigilante, I decided it was time to buy some more silver recently, and I went to the normal places I used to go in Acapulco, Mexico, to buy some. You would think with Mexico being the largest producer of silver in the world that it should be plentiful and easy to find. I went to Azteca Bank, which is where I normally buy, and they said they had none. Azteca is owned by Grupo Salinas, which is effectively owned by Hugo Salinas Price's family. Hugo, as many might know, is a multi-billionaire and one of the biggest proponents of silver. He's even tried without luck to get silver put back into the monetary system in Mexico. I then went to another bank and they said they had none but could order some, but they didn't know how long until it was received. I then sent my driver to every other place that used to sell silver in Acapulco and none was to be found. Mr. Salinas Price is a good friend and a nearby neighbor in Acapulco, so I sent him an email asking him what was happening. He allowed me to reprint his response. Bolded parts are added by myself. We have a problem with Banco de Mexico. They say that, again, the Mint has sent them stained one-ounce sil silver Libertads, and they return them to the Mint. The Mint will have to melt down the whole lot of thousands and remint the coins. This is what we are told. In the meantime, Banco Azteca is selling what coins they have coming from the public. Banco Azteca is now paying the higher price for the one-ounce coins, price usually paid to Banco de Mexico since they are absent, etc., I know Hugo quite well, and he clearly has to be careful about what he says given his position, but I can tell he thinks something is up. I had in the meantime been talking to the Dollar Vigilante reader and excellent writer and researcher Mike Caneo, who told me how premiums for silver have been rising dramatically. He sent me this research. So this is our research on silver premiums, and let's look at the year ago compared to now. 
So for American Eagles, there was a 19% premium today. There's a 30% premium. Uh, Maple Leafs were 18%. They're now 24%. 10 ounce bars, 4%, now 9%. The real action, however, has occurred in 90% junk silver. Uh, 100 face bag uh, a year ago was 5% and is now 40%. That's an eightfold move in the premium. You read that right, a 40% premium on junk silver up from a 5% premium a year ago. This is indicating a long-term structural supply problem in 90% junk silver. The only way to remedy the situation will be much higher prices, either through higher spot silver price, higher premiums, or both. As of now, buyers must pay huge premiums for immediate delivery or wait for the item hopefully to come back into stock. That's the textbook definition of what happens during a shortage. And yet, paper, i.e. not bullion, quoted silver prices continue to fall, not rise. A year ago, spot silver was $19.50 per ounce with a 5% premium. That equates to a price of $20.48. However, with a premium of 40% instead of 5%, an ounce of 90% junk silver now costs $20.44. Contrary to media reports and the depressed paper price, you actually pay just pennies below the 52-week highs for 90% junk silver, even as silver has plunged by over 25%. Do not buy into the lies of a falling silver price. The downside to silver here is extremely limited, and the upside is nearly unlimited. If the price heads any lower, premiums will shoot even higher, or the physical metal will simply vanish until prices head higher. Now, that's what I've seen in the past. In the 2008 uh, shortage or semi-shortage. Uh, there was a time when prices kind of leveled off a little bit, but for the most part, as I told you before, we never saw Silver Eagles go below 16 bucks, even though the price of silver went down to as low as $8.50 at the bottom. So that's happening again. That's very interesting. It's great to see someone like Jeff Berwick, and there are others now starting to report this issue with the junk silver I personally think junk silver is going to be the first to go. I've told you that before. I think the silver eagles are going to be next. And then probably 100 ounce bars. And then it will just flow in through the rest of the bars and the rounds. So let's go to this chart. This is my one of my favorite charts out there. This is from ZeroHedge.com. And this is the history of the reserve currency status. It's called reserve currency status does not last forever. So you can see here that here's the history from basically the mid 1400s to the present on world reserve currency status. You can see it was held by Portugal, then Spain, then the Netherlands, then France and Britain and the US. I'm gonna skip the Britain and the US because we all know that history, but I wanna look a little bit at the history of these earlier ones. Now I want you to note here, although the Netherlands is still fairly powerful uh, with the Hague and all that stuff over there, uh, and Britain through the US is still powerful, but these other three, France, Spain, and Portugal uh, especially, are really just uh, a tiny shadow of their former selves. So let's look at them to see what happens, see if we can find any kind of pattern in uh, these nations. The first one is going to be Portugal uh, and uh, how did Portugal become so powerful? Well, it was through exploring and colonies. It's a pattern we're going to see uh, is world trade, exploration, and then ultimately uh, resistance and war and uh, economic collapse. That's what always happens uh, Portugal spearheaded European exploration in the world and age of discovery. Prince Henry, the navigator, son of King Zhao, became main sponsor and patron of this endeavor. During this period, Portugal explored the Atlantic Ocean, discovering several Atlantic archipelagos like the Azores, Madeira, Cape Verde, explored the African coast, colonized selected areas of Africa, discovered an eastern route to India by the Cape of Good Hope, discovered Brazil, explored the Indian Ocean, established trading routes through most of Southern Asia, and sent the first direct European maritime trade and diplomatic missions to China and Japan. 
1415, Portugal acquired the first of its overseas colonies by conquering Ceuta, the first prosperous Islamic trade center in North America and North Africa. There followed the first discoveries in the Atlantic uh, and first colonization movements. Throughout the 15th century, Portuguese explorers sailed the coast of Africa, establishing trade posts for several common types of tradable commodities at the time, ranging from gold to slaves as they looked for a route to India and its spices, which were coveted in Europe. And then we'll... Uh, Here's the summary. All these factors made Portugal one of the world's major economic, military, and political powers in the 15th century until the late 16th century. Portugal's sovereignty was interrupted between 1580 and 1640. This occurred because the last two kings of the House of Aviz, King Sebastian, who died in the battle, uh, Morocco and his great uncle, etc., War led to a deterioration of the relations with Portugal's oldest ally, England, the loss of Hormuz, a strategic trading post uh, located between Iran and Oman, and etc. The Dutch-Portuguese War, and so you can see the beginning of the decline there. So that's Portugal. Now, the next one that comes up is Spain. And as you know, Spain was uh, very large and very powerful. Uh, for quite a period of time. Spain was Europe's leading power through the 16th century and most of the 17th century, a position reinforced by trade and wealth from colonial possessions and became the world's leading maritime power. It reached its apogee during the reigns of the first two Spanish Habsburgs, Charles I and Philip II. This period saw the Italian Wars, the revolt of the Comuneros, the Dutch Revolt, the Morisco Revolt, clashes with the Ottomans, the Anglo-Spanish War, and wars with France. Through exploration and conquest or royal marriage and alliances and inheritance, the Spanish Empire expanded to include vast areas of the Americas, islands in the Asia-Pacific area, areas of Italy, cities in Northern Africa, as well as parts of what are now France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, the first circumnavigation of the world was carried out in 1519. It was the first empire on which it was said the sun never set. This was the age of discovery with daring explorations by sea and by land, the opening up of new trade routes across oceans, conquests, and beginnings of European colonialism. Spanish explorers brought back precious metals, spices, luxuries, and previously unknown plants and played a leading part in transforming the European understanding of the globe. The cultural efflorescence witnessed during this period is now referred to as the Spanish Golden Age. The expansion of the empire caused immense upheavals in the Americas as the collapse of societies and empires and new diseases from Europe devastated American populations, etc. The late 16th century and first half of the 17th century, Spain was confronted by unrelenting challenges from all sides, Barbary pirates, the growing Ottoman Empire, uh, problems with the slave trade and the Islamic invasion, and then war with France, uh, the Protestant Reformation, and uh, then plagues. So that's the beginning of the decline of the Spanish Empire. And then the last one we're going to look at here is, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to look at the, at the Netherlands next. And you can see here... Uh, the Dutch Golden Age, spanning much of the 17th century, the Dutch Empire grew to become one of the most major seafaring, here it is again, and economic powers. Science, military, and art and painting were among the most acclaimed in the world. By 1650, the Dutch owned 16,000 merchant ships. The Dutch East India Company and Dutch West India Company established colonies and trading posts all over the world. The Dutch settlement in North America began with the founding of New Amsterdam, the southern part of Manhattan, in 1614. In South Africa, the Dutch settled the Cape Colony in 1652. Dutch colonies in South America were established along with many rivers in the fertile Guyana Plains, among them uh, Suriname and the Dutch East Indies and uh, Post in Japan. Many economic historians regard the Netherlands as the first thoroughly capitalist country in the world, in early modern Europe, it had the wealthiest trading city, Amsterdam, and the first full-time stock exchange. 
The inventiveness of the traders led to the insurance and retirement funds as well as phenomena such as boom and bust cycle and inflation asset bubble. The tulip mania of 1636, the world's first bear raider, and uh, prices falling. The Republic went into a general state of decline in the 18th century with economic competition from England and long-standing rivalries between the two main factions in Dutch society. So that was the decline of the Dutch, and you can see in these that uh, they uh, all um, they're all involved with each other. The rising powers, the falling powers, um, they're all involved with each other, and I think we're seeing that now with the U.S. The last one we'll look at is France, and uh, a lot of people don't know that France was that powerful. Uh, the French Renaissance saw a spectacular cultural development, the first standardization of the French language, which would become the official language of France and the language of Europe's aristocracy. It also saw a long set of wars known as the Italian Wars between the Kingdom of France and the powerful Holy Roman Empire. French explorers such as Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain claimed lands in the Americas for France, paving the way for the expansion of the first French colonial empire. The rise of Protestantism in Europe led France to a civil war known as the French Wars of Religion, where in the most notorious incident, thousands of Huguenots were murdered in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. The Wars of Religion were ended by Henry the Fourth's Edict of Nantes, which granted some freedom of religion. And of course, you know, we have the French Revolution, and uh, then we have the rise of Napoleon. So I'm not going to go into all that. So uh, then the next ones we have, you know, we have the British Empire, which pretty much their reserve currency status ended around World War II. And then that was the beginning of the U.S. reserve currency status. So you can see there the rise and decline of these empires. Is the U.S. in decline? Yes, I, I believe the U.S. is definitely in decline. Uh, the next empire in my opinion, is China, and this is the stage that we're going through right now. So you can see when you look down through history that these transitions are marked by wars of rivalry, rivalry between the rising power and the falling power. It also has to do with broken alliances between some of the former powers. So even though Portugal had already been surpassed, uh, supplanted by Spain, it was actually an action that they took that weakened Spain and gave a uh, place for the Netherlands to rise up. And uh, so that's the type of patterns that we're seeing. Uh, I personally believe that it, the United States is in decline. China is on the rise. But this transition is going to be marked by a lot of uh, potential warfare and uh, disruption to world trade as it always has. And we'll talk to you next time.